Hey guys, I am Rylan Grant, the Ringo Award winning creator of fine comics like Aberrant, Banjax, and now Suicide Jockeys, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented individual. This is his first time on the show. He is a, a native of the Detroit area, Michigan region. He is a very talented screenwriter, filmmaker, but he's also in the comic industry as well. We're joined today by Raylan Grant. How are you doing today, Raylan? Not too bad. How are you doing? Doing good, doing good. Um, I love first timers on the show because I'm always interested to see what they're promoting and who they are and everything along that line. And I know you've said this, I'm sure a million times before, but how did you get started? Not only as a filmmaker, but also as a comic book writer. Uh, how did I get started as a, as a writer, Bob? So we're going way back. You want like, you want yeah. the origin story, not the uh, five years ago story. I grew up in a housing project in Detroit. It wasn't a great place. You know, <laughs> you know I didn't have great people around me and um, the adults in my life didn't necessarily, um, I don't, they weren't the greatest example, right? The TV raised me. I spent my, uh, my childhood kind of glued to the television and, you know, watching sitcoms and, you know, movies and you know, probably a lot of movies that I shouldn't have been watching at uh, uh, that young an age, but um, was riveted. And, um, you know, I learned, uh, I learned right and wrong. I learned morality from, uh, from the television, you know, Captain Picard taught me how to, <laughs> how to be a man. <laughs> taught me uh, what's a value and whatnot. Um, you know, but then also it, um, you know, it taught me that there was this world outside of, uh, of this place that I grew up for better or for worse. Most of the people that I grew up with, they're, they're still there, you know, they're, uh, you know, they, they were born, they're going to live, they're going to die about five minutes away from where they, um, again, from where they were born. And I saw this other world out there. I was always intrigued by it. I needed a way out. And so I think from a young age, I was very much focused on kind of getting out and, and, and seeing, uh, you know, the larger world. I ended up with a scholarship at the University of Michigan. You know, Ann Arbor was not that far away from Detroit geographically, ideologically, philosophically, politically, Berkeley at the East to a certain degree. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the more kind of liberal institutions in the, uh, in the world. And, you know, grew up in kind of a very conservative place. And so um, those ideas kind of colliding was a big deal for me at a young age. Um, I actually went to college originally to, uh, um, to study political science. Um, I, I, I was like groomed from a young age to be a political operative. My, uh, my dad had me, um, you know, standing at a polling place, uh, when I was about 10, you know, with a sandwich board, um, uh, uh campaigning for, um, I think it was HW Bush at that, uh, at that time. I did something for every major and local election until I graduated high school. You know, I was, uh, the president of like young political organizations growing up and I actually almost went to the Naval Academy, which is funny. I had a, you know, cause I'd done all this political work. I had my congressional appointment and, um, you know, kind of 11th hour, this, uh, scholarship came from the university of Michigan and my dad, who was a Vietnam veteran, talked me out of it, which is probably a good thing. Cause, uh, you know, September 11th was like right around the corner, but yeah, you know, it went to the, to Michigan to study political science. You know, it was right around the time that politics was kind of becoming this ugly contradictory quagmire. I mean, like it always had been, but it got so much worse. Like what we're experiencing now was really kind of like coming into prominence, uh, uh, uh there and more than anything, it's just like being exposed to, to all this different, you know, all these different influences, I just kind of realized that the world wasn't black and white, like, like I had been taught and it really pissed me off. I spent a full semester or so kind of, uh, steeped in the politics of it all. And, uh, I was just miserable. I mean, you know, total, total breakdown. I had this kind of like cliche of a, of a day of a night at the end of my first semester where I was, um, I was registered for, I don't know, three political science classes, uh, uh again, just staring at another like miserable semester of this. And I just couldn't do it. You know, and I had this like full on meltdown, uh, you know, walked around campus all, uh, all, all night again. I told you this is going to be like a movie cliche, but, and then at 7 a.m. when like the online registration uh, system opened up, uh, I dropped all my classes and I picked up a course guide and started flipping through. Can't sleep in this misery anymore. What is going to make me happy? Like, you know, I, I have an opportunity at this at this this higher learning institution. Like, uh, what is going to make me happy? And I just started flipping through and just looking for what was going to uh, to make me happy. And so I, I registered for two film classes, an environmental science class, and a uh, an art history class. 
And then um, a few years later, I graduated with a triple major in, in film, theater, and art history. And then I was, it was kind of off to the races for there. I mean, I found film, came out to Los Angeles. I, I went to the uh, uh, grad school, the American Film Institute Conservatory, which is where like David Lynch went, uh, Aronofsky, and you know, a bunch of other kind of snooty filmmakers. And I got my own, my snooty, uh, uh, you know, film education there. About halfway through AFI, I wrote a script that kind of broke me. It placed in a few competitions, the the Academy's Nichols Fellowship, uh, but then it won the final draft big uh, break competition, um, and um, it kind of launched me. And it went all over, you know, went all over Hollywood, and you know, tons of meetings. I mean, that film almost got made a couple of times. Um, I mean, I sat down with you know Tony Scott and Joel Schumacher and Simon West right after he did Con Air, but but more than anything, it just ended up getting me a lot of other work, and so. Um, Penelope Cruz hired me uh, about halfway through AFI to write this film um, called Haunted Heart with uh, Fernando Trueba, who's a, a really big deal in Spain. He, um, he won the Oscar for foreign language film years back with uh, Bella Poke. And so um, that was my first job, you know, as a scared kind of kid in his early 20s, you know, writing with an Oscar winner for an A-list act- actress. <laughs> and, uh, and I was just kind of off to the races and, you know, I mean, not at all prepared for it. And so, you know, it, uh, went very poorly in a lot of ways. We can talk about that if you want. You know, but also yeah, eventually I kind of found my footing. I mean, I've spent about the last 15 years uh, as a, a, a screenwriter in Hollywood, you know, developing film and TV projects. Folks like Ridley Scott and J.J. Abrams and John Woo and Luke Poisson and, and Justin Lin and, you know, on and on and on, uh, you know, mostly uh, kind of big poppy action stuff. Yeah, about five years ago, I kind of swerved into the comic book. Line. That's my origin story, short and sweet. A lot i know five years ago you start writing comic books you know you're you're successful as a as a screenwriter and you're into the comic book genre now and you're writing some amazing works uh what is this newest series that you're working on yeah well um you know the yeah the new series is called uh uh, uh suicide jockeys um it is a uh a tokusatsu joint um and so uh tokusatsu for the uninitiated uh, you all know what tokusatsu is. You may not know the word tokusatsu. It's a Japanese word. Uh, so tokusatsu is the uh, Japanese sci-fi action genre that includes um, you know, stuff like Power Rangers and Super Sentai and uh, and, and, and Voltron. Um, it also includes kaiju fair, like uh, like Godzilla. The pitch, in a nutshell, is it is uh, Fast and the Furious meets Voltron, a surly kind of dirty dozen like bunch of uh, of you know armored tank and aircraft. To kind of you know climb out of these big machines and uh, and and beat back uh, 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 kaiju monsters. It's this trip of a ride, you know, fun kind of howling at the moon type uh, actiony stuff. The story behind it is really interesting. I mean, the 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 Fast and the Furious meets Voltron is is very apt. So um, one of the weirder lines in my bio that doesn't get explored a lot is that I'm a, um, I happen to be an ordained Soto Zen Buddhist monk. Um, you know, which is probably a, a whole show into itself. We don't need to talk about it too much. You know, I, I kind of, you know, teach meditation and meditate a lot. That's really all that it means. But um, Soto Zen is a, a Japanese sect, right? And so because of that, I have a lot of weird, just Japanese connections in general, you know, particularly um, connections with the Japanese uh, film industry. Um, and so one of those uh, is a guy named Brad Warner. So Brad is an ordained Soto Zen uh, Buddhist monk like me but he also happens to be a pretty prolific author in his own right. I mean, he's one of, uh, I don't know, three like uh, uh, authors who are kind of the Zen authors in America. Um, he's written probably about a dozen books, but the, you know, the most popular and well-known is a book called Hardcore Zen, a kind of American Zenny's technical manual. Um, great book, you know, and it's sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Go grab it if you're at all interested in meditation or Zen or anything like that. You know, so, I mean, Brad and I were both creatives and both writers and, and both really interested in, in stuff like this. So Brad is an author in his own right, but what Brad did was, um, you know, Brad had kind of a similar fallout like I did when, when he was in college and he ended up kind of picking up everything and he moved to Japan to make monster movies. And so for a dozen years, Brad worked um, uh, for a company called Zubaraya Productions, which was founded by the, um, uh, the guy who created Godzilla. Uh, and they've done, you know, hundreds of tokusatsu shows and movies at this point, but they are best known for doing all the Ultraman. And so, you know, everybody kind of knows Ultraman. Uh, uh, Ultraman is like the most popular show in the world. A lot of people don't know that. It's not as popular here in the States, but it is kind of the biggest deal globally. And so, yeah, Brad was um, for 
you know, about a dozen years, a producer and executive on Ultraman. He is a historian of tokusatsu. He knows this stuff backwards and forwards. He's like an encyclopedia. Brad and I uh, kind of co-conceived this. I kind of wrote it from there. So when I say kind of Voltron meets Fast and the Furious, Brad very much has the Voltron down. You know, we have our tokusatsu cred. And then when I say Fast and the Furious, one of my kind of weird claims to fame uh, in the film business is that I've actually written for the directors of six of the nine Fast and the Furious movies. I mean, I have that covered, you know, um, I have written kind of big poppy action movies uh, my entire career. Yeah, it's this weird kind of, you know, meeting of the minds on this stuff. A couple of times a year, we would go on these Zen retreats in the mountains uh, at the Mount Baldy Zen Center. Which, for Leonard Cohen fans, Leonard Cohen was a big uh, uh, Zenny also, and this is kind of where he used to go and uh, on retreat. He actually recorded a couple of albums up there. Really interesting place. Uh, there's like a creative spirit up there, but you know, Brad and I would go up on these retreats and, you know, you're, you're in silence for most of these, uh, for most of this stuff. But, you know, when you were allowed to talk, Brad and I would really kind of get talking about, oh, these, you know, these things that we loved when we were kids and what we were working on and blah, 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 blah. And invariably, these conversations would always sort of take this twist towards, okay, well, you know, why, why isn't tokusatsu as big in the States as it is in, in, in Asia. Um, why isn't it getting its due? You know, I mean, it has like its niche audience. There are people who kind of love it and love it for its camp and all that stuff, but like, it's not, it's not as cool as it should be. Right. And so we started talking about, okay, well, well, you know, how do you cool this stuff up? How do you kind of package this and present it to kind of like a rabid uh, American uh, action, you know, uh, movie audience? What is the billion dollar fil- uh, box office version of this? Over a couple of years, we just started kind of talking about this thing and building it out and um suicide jockeys is is what we ended up with it is tokusatsu for the you know for the rabid american action movie fan and um it, it, it was weird um you start to talk about influences i am like an action movie junkie i mean anything i write is going to be influenced by you know, the, the diehards and the beverly hills cops but i really found myself at the time obsessed with there is a sort of subsection of subgenre of, of, of action that happened in the mid to late 90s. And it was these like really kind of tuned up, you know, swaggery machismo action movies uh, that all kind of landed for some reason at the same time. And I'm talking about films like Face Off and Con Air and The Rock and Armageddon. Um, you know, it was a it was a, a a certain type of kind of ensemble action movie that was really about kind of testosterone and swagger and quippy one liners and stuff yeah. like that. I can, yeah, sure, you, you can see my 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 crazy oh. uh, uh, abode here. But um, uh, behind yeah, behind Arnold from the At Last Action Hero, there is a VCR and a uh, a, a little CTR television. Um, and so I, while I'm writing, I just, I throw old VHS tapes on. I have a, this kind of massive collection of old VHS tapes. And so, um, if I'm looking for inspiration, a lot of times it's just on around in the background, but if I'm looking for inspiration, I'll just kind of throw them on. And so there's always something on. And so those are the movies I had on while I was, while I was writing this thing and they just kind of started seeping in. You know, those movies are a fucking great time, you know, and like in the best way, they're kind of like being strapped to the head of a rocket and shot, you know, to the moon. And so that was the spirit that we uh, that we kind of embraced here. But I think as you get into it, there there's more to it. This, in a way, is kind of a Boogie Nights esque dissection of a non traditional family. All of my stuff is about kind of getting my my psychological demons in a room and beating the shit out of them. And so mm-hmm. um, this deals with the psychology of the characters in a really uh, uh, deep, meaningful way. A way that you you know, that you're not used to seeing, I guess, in this kind of comic fair or in that kind of movie fair. So there's that also. You have two, you know, Zen monks telling a story, um, you know, about time travel and the meaning of, you know, existence and the fabric of reality and stuff like that for, you know, 2000 plus years, uh, you know, Buddhism and I guess for 800 plus years, Zen uh, has dealt with, this stuff in a really interesting way. Um, and so there's a way to look at this where, um, you know, we're kind of teaching uh, uh, Zen with this book. And, and you know, m- maybe that's a little hyperbolic. We are having a very meaningful, interesting Zen conversation here. The same kind of conversation we would have about, uh, you know, again, time or, or the fabric of reality or, or whatever, you know, that we'd have like at the Mount Baldy Zen Center while we were on retreat yeah. we're having in this book. There's a little bit of something for everybody. I mean, it is um, it, it is just kind of fun action, but there are really meaningful philosophical conversations happening here also. First thing I was going to ask, though, was uh, as a an ordained 
monk. How did that affect your writing style? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, the first thing, yeah, the first thing that happened was kind of fear and panic. Uh, there is something called the Ten Grave Precepts uh, in, in Zen. The kind of arm of Buddhism has their, their precepts, and they're all pretty similar. But, you know, they're the Zen versions of the Ten Commandments, uh, but they're not, you know, I mean, ten, the Ten Commandments are do this or like God's going to fire a lightning bolt up your ass, right? That's not what they are in Zen. It's like, well, you know, if you want to lead a, a, a good and meaningful life, like here's, here's a roadmap. Here, here's how a Buddha would behave. Um, and really the practice ends up being about like, okay, well, these aren't black and white things, right? It's really um, the practice ends up being like finding the right shade of gray for every moment, for every situation, right? But my first teacher was a guy named Thich Nhat Hanh, who um, was a Vietnamese Zen monk who, um, he has written, you know, literally hundreds of these books. Uh, he's about 90 right now. He is a, a Vietnamese monk that um, uh, Martin Luther King nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and his uh, his um, most interesting one is called uh, Living Buddha, Living Christ, which is just kind of a comparison of Christianity and uh and, and, and Buddhism, Zen Buddhism uh, uh, in particular, that's very kind of interesting and meaningful. If a housewife in Nebraska knows like one Zen monk, they probably know Thich Nhat Hanh. But Thich Nhat Hanh is pretty like hard line, you know? And if you start getting into precept discussions with him, he believes there's always a precept against, against intoxication, right? Everybody interprets it in a different way. There are people who say, you know, basically like just don't use intoxicants, period, right? Um, uh, you know, no alcohol, no, uh, no drugs, uh, nothing like that. Um, there are other people that are like, well, um, that interpret the, the, that precept as, well, don't drink to excess, right? You know, have a couple of beers, but don't, <laughs> but, but, don't but don't get crazy. Don't get out of line. Yeah. Uh, don't black out and, um, and, you know, wake up next to a prostitute. There are other people that um, are even looser about it. Well, okay, the precept for, for us is actually don't make your living selling alcohol. And that's a longer discussion, but Thich Nhat Hanh takes a really hard line on this. Like he says that basically like anything that we consume is a potential intoxicant, right? And so that, that it of course includes drugs and alcohol, but it also includes the books you read and the TV you watch and the, you know, the magazines and, and the, the, you know, the social media and all that stuff. And, and, you know, I mean, he, he is right in, in a general sense, uh, but he takes a really hard line on it. And when I was a young, impressionable kind of Zen student, you know, it freaked me out a little bit. Uh, I mean, he's saying, yeah, you know, action movie, you know, Pulp Fiction is basically heroin, you know, uh, and people are ODing on it um, over and over again. And Pulp Fiction was the thing that made me want to make movies, you know, maybe when I fucking tell stories in general. So that was hard to hear. And y you can spend uh, a weekend at the Deer Birth Monastery uh, uh, with Thich Nhat Hanh and leave, you know, leave thinking that as a screenwriter, you're basically like, you know, an arms dealer or something like that, you know, that, that you're, uh, that you're, you're, you know, Omar from The Wire. And, you know, it, 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 I didn't I didn't go that far with it, but I was a little bit freaked out. Like I had to take a long look at, OK, well, you know, um, what does this mean? You know what I'm saying? And, and that's all Zen is, you know, it, with Zen, they never tell you, oh, it's got to be this way or this way or stop doing this or stop doing that. It's like really the Zen is about just asking yourself these questions and exploring these questions meaningfully and, and figuring out what it all means to you. And more importantly, like what it should mean to you in terms of like its effect on the world. Right. Yeah, I had to take a long look at that. And I sat with some other teachers and really kind of beat this question up with them. And what I kept hearing back from teachers that, you know, I now really kind of am all in with and fully respect is like, somebody who's going to write action movies, somebody who's going to write comic books. And they would say, I feel a lot more comfortable it being a person like you who is actually sitting here asking these questions, right? What effect do my movies have on the world at large? Like, what am I putting out into the universe, right? And how is that going to be twisted and turned and used? How is that going to move someone this way or that way? Just embracing the idea of, okay, well, you have a, um, you're on a stage now and people are paying attention to you. People are listening to you. People are reading your books and watching your movies. What are you going to do with that power, right? What is your responsibility to the world? Um, and so I think, you know, when you ask me, like, what, what, what effect has it had? First and foremost, that's it is that um, I have kind of come to terms with what an enormous responsibility uh, it is to, um, to have people reading your books, to, to have people watching movies that you've written. And, um, and so, yeah, I take that very seriously. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, a, I mean, you've heard my taste in movies, right? <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I love, I, I mean, there's nothing more noble than entertaining people. I'm not snooty about it. I'm not, you know, uh, um, 
you know, I, I, I'm not stodging about any of this stuff. Um, you know, I, I like fun. And so, you know, however, it's like, um, you just have to, you have to be a little conscious about, about what you're putting out there. And so I've taken that very seriously. And I think more than anything, it's like, um, what it's done is, you know, just 15 plus years of Zen practice. I mean, probably 20 plus years of Buddhism and, you know, 30 odd years of, of just, you know, searching in general. Um, it's just taught me to kind of ask big questions and to try to get to the bottom of things. And so like, I don't think it's enough to just have like actually nonsense where people are kind of shooting up stuff. Like um, every one of my issues, even if it is a, a hollow at the moon, like, you know, fucking roller coaster ride. Um, I'm asking a big philosophical existential question in that issue and wrestling with it. And it is about people like me and people like us sorting their shit out. Um, I think if you're going to write one of these things, it might as well be about something. And it, 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 if you're going to ask people to, spend money on a book or you know point down the 37 dollars or whatever it is for a movie ticket these days you might as well give them something meaningful uh it is your duty to give them something meaningful you know when i started out writing i was i was very much kind of doing impressions of uh of you know people that i admired right um and you know there's 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 no meaning there's no substance to imitation really the gift zen gave to me was okay well uh what do i have to say and then let me take a long look at how I now, let me figure out how to say that, right? So I think that that's, that's the gift Zen has given to me. And, and, and the funny thing is, I mean, some of this stuff I've, I've um, some of this stuff I've kind of explored in my own mind before. I mean, certainly the like, oh, what is my responsibility? But, um, but this idea of kind of Zen preparing me for things in this way, I, I don't know that I've explored before. So this is interesting. Thank you for that. <laughs> What has uh, what has two geeks talking uh, 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 done for me in terms of my <laughs> there it is just uh, put me in a credit or something like that or you know uh, whatever you'd like to do uh, you know, special thanks you know that that works out for I, you. I, I'm, I, I'm not a, I got you man yeah <laughs> I'm not I'm not in here for profit I'm in here for having great conversations and diving into the mindset of creative people as I have for the past thirteen years so yeah. it's so hearing your thoughts and hearing your your journey as you are well i mean we're all continuously on a journey of creativity in some way shape or form um looking at this comic as well looking at suicide jockeys is is just it's an action-packed ride and the fact that you're throwing in these moral quandaries and and looking at the lives of your characters on on a deeper level is just wonderful to see truly i think that uh, I wish more comic books would actually do that rather than going the superficial route of, like you said, here's an action scene just to shoot up some stuff. Yeah. So, uh, you know, keep, I, I think I can't wait to see more of Suicide Jockeys and anything else that, that you actually create. Now I want to look at your archive. I want to look at your past works. And I want to see exactly what what I can draw from as, as a person. So thank you for being an awesome person so far. Yeah. Well, well, thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, I mean, every book I've done has really been about what's behind the action and what is, you know, a, a, a deconstruction of, uh, of all of that uh, stuff. I mean, you know, my, my first book was a, a book called Aberrant. Aberrant is, um, you know, it is kind of a, a love letter to seventies paranoid uh, spy thrillers. We've seen, love letters to these movies you know i mean the born identity was kind of one and mike clayton was one of these but um yeah you know some of my i mean some of my you know marathon man and uh you know three days of the condor and stuff like that but you know i mean on the surface it is a it is a a badass action you know movie it is um th this is a world in which people with superpowers exist but it's not really about the people with superpowers it's about what everyone else is doing um, and it, it is a, an examination of how our military, how our geopolitics would necessarily change if there were people with superpowers around, right? Um, and so this U.S. Army Special Operations Commander, um, uh, he loses his entire unit to a superhuman attack. Um, and then, you know, nothing gets done about it. And so he goes AWOL and he goes after the kind of uh, the, the billionaire and, and former superhero that he believes is responsible. And, and uh, but then it turns out, well, He's not as responsible as we think. There's a guy behind the guy, and then the book becomes about kind of peeling back the layers of this conspiracy, right? And it's always, you know, it's always this kick you in the face, you know, action joint. But you know, really, it's about kind of, you know, it's it's ten issues of of dealing with with loss, right? Um, and dealing with, you know, 
PTSD and um, and having fought, you know, a war for 10 years at that point that, you know, you're, you're looking around and you don't necessarily <laughs> see what you've changed. A lot of lives have been lost and a lot of people have been hurt. And and uh, and how do we sort through all of this, you know? And, and so in that case, it's really about like what we're what we're going through as a society. I mean, it, it, it is it is particularly interesting right now with us, you know, having just withdrawn from Afghanistan, and uh, and, and it's going horribly, horribly wrong, right? The action is fun and it's great and you need it and I love it, uh, but it's not enough. So, what are the big questions you're wrestling with, right? Well, going back to suicide jockeys currently, though, um, you said that you're you basically you're taking your I'm going to use that term loosely, and you're turning it into your characters. You're turning it into something that you can wrestle with as as a writer. You know, what did you draw from to create these characters? Then that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that um, I mean the first thing is that it is it is about this kind of non traditional family. It's about this family that we create, right? I mean, for me necessarily, um, family has never been blood, right? Family is the, the people that are. The people that are there for you, right? I mean, I think we all have that to a certain degree. It's like we, well, we grow up with a family, and it's good and it's bad, but whatever. Then we go off to college, or, or you know, and we create a new family for a couple of years, right? You know, in my case, I moved out to Los Angeles, and you know, that college family was no longer around. You know, and you never totally lose touch with them, but you create this, you know, entirely new family in, in Los Angeles, and then you get married and you have a kid. And you buy a house and suddenly you have this new family <laughs> and that's a lot so it's about these families that we create in a lot of ways but then it's also you know when someone has been established as family and deputized as, as family knighted as family um you never really lose them right you know one, one of my two or three best friends my whole life was this uh this guy named steve and we met in high school and then about halfway through high school he ended up moving away we have lived you know, in the same area, we haven't been in a room together too much, like for, I don't know, 20 years or something like that. Right. But, um, but he's family and, and no matter what, you know, whenever we pick up the phone, we just kind of pick back up where we left off. Right. Um, and that's something very interesting. It's very, it's very real, like that you can kind of hit the pause button for, you know, I don't know, two years. And then like you, you get back in a room with somebody you, you and, and it's just, it's like nothing has changed. Right. And so, you know, I'm exploring that dynamic. I'm exploring, you know, what is the definition of family? And was, you know, and then, you know, family is it's also this thing where it's like, I mean, nobody can hurt you like your family, right? With a friend or an acquaintance, if they do something terrible to you, uh, you can just excise them from your life, right? You never need to see them again. And it doesn't bother you at all. In fact, like you, you revel in it. But family is not like that. There is this gravitational pull that is inescapable, right? So you guys can, you guys can do horrible, horrible things to each other, and uh, you know, in fact, like you have the goods on them. Your acquaintance is not going to know you as well. They don't know all of your soft spots. They don't know, they don't know your Achilles heels. They don't know how to hurt you. Like family knows how to hurt you, right? And and they can't say the awful things that an acquaintance can say to you. And you know, families they can, they can absolutely wreck each other, but you know, then like you can't necessarily, you can't just excise them. You can't cut them out. There's, there's, there's still this, 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 this gravitational pull, this like invisible tether that will pull you back. There's a lot of that. I mean, our protagonist Denver are, are kind of swaggery Bruce Willis type. I mean, this is a, um, you know, this is definitely a diverse cast book and, and there are a lot of different points of view, you know, a lot of different, I mean, every, I think every member of this family has a very kind of different, you know, background, whether it's, uh, you know, socially, politically, uh, uh, ethically, all of these things. But our um, our lead, our sort of father figure is this kind of Bruce Willis type. And it's, 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 he's this interesting study because it's like, he's a dinosaur to a certain degree. He is born out of like, John McClane and Die Hard and Bruce Willis and Armageddon. Uh, I have Sean Connery and, and The Rock, you know, our, our, our dynamic duo and Face Off. I mean, he is one of these heroes, right? I mean, he is this like swaggery, unapologetic, non-PC sort of character. And that was fine back then, right? I mean, th th this is a book that, I mean, the, the issue one takes place on kind of two planes, right? There was this, this event that happened 10 years ago that was horrible. It's the mission that goes horribly wrong tears the entire family apart. And basically what happens in the first issue is 10 years later, somebody kind of comes out of the shadows and says, hey, you know, that thing that happened 10 years ago, um, uh, we can fix it, right? Uh, 
but again, the family's been torn apart. Like everybody's off in their own corners. Um, and our protagonist, our Bruce Willis character, has to kind of slap the family back together and go and, and kind of write what went wrong, right? Um, but there's so much hurt and there's so much anger and, and so many fences that need to be mended. And in a way, he's the least equipped to do it. I mean, it, 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 again, like how he acted, who he was, was fine 10 years ago. Now the world is very different, right? Um, uh, we have, um, you know, we're a lot more PC. We're a lot more socially conscious. Uh, pe- people are getting canceled right and left. And so how does, how does a, a, a 90s action hero, um, he's a man out of time. How does a 90s action hero like navigate that world? You know, um, <laughs> he's, he's not, he, he, he falls on his face a lot. He has the best intentions. I mean, I think that that is the thing is like this cultural conversation we're having now is very important. Uh, uh, let me say that, that that first and foremost, it's taking us someplace, I, I think, kind of wonderful and someplace great. It's a high wire act, however, um, because I think that, you know, one misstep can, it, 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 it. yeah, it can, get, it can get you set aside. You, know what I'm saying? you can get canceled for one misstep now. No one is allowed to find their way through this thing. People make mistakes. People fall on their faces. And of course, I mean, don't get me wrong. Some things are absolutely inexcusable. And there are a lot of well-meaning people who are, who, who, who will fall. And I think that we need to allow them to fall a little bit and find their way. And this is an examination of a man who's, he's very sincerely trying to find his way uh, through this new world. He loves these people. And this, this, this mission is very important to him. And he's, he's, he's very desperately and sincerely trying to do it, but he's an asshole (laughs) and he has a lot to overcome. Um, You know, we, we, we wrestle with this thing back then we wrestle with this thing of our, our, this idea of our programming, right? You know, I I, I grew up in a uh, I grew up in a housing project uh, in Detroit, and it was it was hell. It was like it, it was like going to war every day uh, uh, in a lot of ways. And so I was programmed uh, uh, from a a very young age to deal with that, right? Okay, well, you know, you're gonna step outside, and like the guy across the street may want to hurt you. So how how do you then behave? You know, I, I had to start looking at everyone as a potential threat, right? the values of a lot of people uh, uh, back where I came from, uh, you know, be it socially, politically, uh, economically, uh, were completely twisted. And that was what I learned. You know what I'm saying? That was what I learned. When I went to the University of Michigan, um, I had all of this programming that was pretty gross in a lot of ways. Um, but that was all I had, right? But, but, but now I'm in this different place with different people, uh, with different values and, 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 and people who are like socially conscious and, and, and environmentally conscious and all that stuff. Um, that was very foreign to me. And, and, and I fell on my face a lot dealing with that, you know, because like, okay, well, well, I have these programs that run, you know, you, you see it in your everyday life. Like um, you, you are on the freeway, right. And somebody cuts you off and you fly off the handle, you start swearing, you're laying into your horn, you're, you're, you know, you do not do that voluntarily. You uh, you grew up watching your dad do that, um, and we learned that's what you do. You know, you were wronged, and this is how you behave. And then when you're 15 and you start driving with your learner's permit, that starts immediately. And then you do that for 10 years, for 15 years, for 20 years. It just becomes your programming again. You are not making the conscious decision to do that. Somebody cuts you off, and boom, your body just runs that program. Your mind just runs that program. And Zen practice, in a lot of ways, is you sit very silently and you watch yourself. That's really all it is. And then you start to see your programming. You, when, when somebody cuts you off, you start to see, oh, wow, that, that fly off the handle program is coming up. And then when you can see that happening, as opposed to just being kind of a slave to it, then choice comes into the matter, right? Like, oh, you know what? I can, I can stop that. I can, I, I can just hit stop on that. On that. I, I don't have to do that. I can just hit stop on that, on that program. Um, and then what you realize is that you can start to then edit your programming. You can start to rid yourself of programs that that that, that aren't aren't beneficial to you or, or, or to the world. You can write a new program for what happens when somebody uh, uh, when somebody cuts you off on the freeway. Um, you know, okay, well, I'm just going to I'm going to take a deep breath and count to three when somebody cuts me off on the freeway, and I'll be fine. Um, I'm going to sing a song. I'm going to you know do whatever. I have struggled with that uh, for a very long time. We all have a lot of terrible influences on us, right? This is back to your original question. You know, what am I wrestling with in the book? Horrible programming, uh, you know, from, from, from growing up where I grew up. Michigan was a wonderful place in a lot of ways, but it was also a Big Ten school. And there's a lot of partying and a lot of, you know, weird stuff that comes with that. Um, then you go to like a crazy 
uh, art conservatory after that. And there's a lot of weird shit that happens. Um, you, you break as a screenwriter when you're way too young, you know, and, and, and you do some regrettable things and stuff like that. Then you kind of find yourself at some point, right? You start unpacking all of that and you start wrestling with kind of who you were and what you want to be. Um, and so, you know, that's what we're seeing with our, with our protagonist, with Denver. Um, we're seeing him kind of unpack. He's looking back at, at, at all the regret. He's looking back at, at you know, at, at, at these, you know, years of his life that, you know, he didn't, he didn't do things like he should have and like he wanted to. And so he's, 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 he's taking stock. He's, he's starting to see his programming and hopefully starting to rewrite it. You know? Awesome. Um, you know, you, you touch upon the fact that you had a triple major. I mean, not saying overachieving, but I only did a double major in film and visual arts myself too. Oh. So, so I, I'm not quite to your level, but art history was one of my favorite subjects as well too. I had a great um, art historian teacher who does tours and all that stuff and lives in Michigan actually. Yeah. Um, anyhow, so I was curious as a, as a filmmaker and a, and a, a writer as well, which artist from the past that had never touched anything film equipment wise would be a great director and a great writer. <laughs> wow. Uh, 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 that is an interesting uh, uh, question. I was a big modern art guy, modern painters uh, specifically. Um, abstract expressionism was a, a, a big love of mine. Yeah, there was a long love affair. Um, I, I lived and worked in New York for um, a good while. I was called in originally to um, kind of put together a script development program for uh, uh, Hal Hartley who's kind of like, you know, one of the OG indie directors, you know, Henry Fool was, I think it's probably the best known film, but did some great films, Trust, The Unbelievable Truth. Um, if you don't know Al Hartley and you're a, you're a filmmaker, uh, you should yeah. get into it because he's awesome. Living in New York when I did and having all those museums around and being kind of, um, you know, steeped in um, the American, I, I used to go to the MoMA. The MoMA was like, take what you wish on Friday. I would just go, I would go every week and I would, um, I would stare at the same, you know, 50 paintings or something like that. So I had a very long love affair with, um, Pablo Picasso sounds a little bit cliche and easy. Um, but you know, the Mona has like 80 Picassos. Um, and so you're not going and looking at one Picasso. You can walk into a room and there'll be 30 Picassos and they put them all there for a reason because like, you know, he was working something out. It's like, you know, you start to see like, you know, he has a landscape and then sudden, and then two, two, three paintings later, like a, a certain face, a mask starts to appear in the landscape and he becomes obsessed with that mask and you see it for 12 more paintings, uh, you know, and then it starts to fade out of the landscape and then the landscape turns into something else. Willem de Kooning uh, is, is, oh, a, yes. is, is a huge favorite. And that was really about, you know, it was about this kind of raw and visceral emotion. His, his women series is, um, is, 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 is something that I, I, you know, I think the, I mean, the first time I saw one, I was just knocked on my ass. And, you know, so here's a painting of a woman. And it's like, you know, it's essentially a stick figure, but it's more than that. It's like, there is so much love and hate and anguish and reverie and, you know, every emotion that he's ever experienced with, I don't know whether it was this, a, a particular woman or, you know, whether it was a, a woman in general. I guess to answer your question, I would look for somebody who kind of looks at the world in a different way. I mean, who would make a good filmmaker you know, it's not somebody that's just going to capture reality. I mean, you know, that would be the equivalent of uh, reality television or something like that, I guess. If you look at my film work, if you look at my uh, my comic book work in particular, I am obsessed with deconstruction. I am obsessed with experimental elements. The whole reason I got into comics um, was because I got so bored with where film was. And after about 12 years of doing film stuff, I saw Pulp Fiction. I fell in love with movies. I said, I want to do that. I came out, I went to the American Film Institute Conservatory and um, and I got my study film education, you know, where the David Lipschitz and the Aronofsky study. Um, and I was on track to do that. But by the time I got spit into the, uh, the, the, the working world of the film business, they had stopped making those movies, right? And so these days, Hollywood makes five different kinds of movies. They, they, they want them all written a certain way. And I got very good at at, at writing those those five movies the way they want me to write them i mean i you know they you know they they bought my house um i can you know i can write those in my sleep 
but man, it, 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 it got boring. And, you know, I, I hate being the guy who complains about getting great movies for a living. I sound like an asshole when I do it, but, um, but it was not what I signed up for, you know, um, I was very lucky, but it was not what I want, what I expected it to be, what I wanted it to be. I don't know if I can do this for another 12 years. Like the, the worst thing was that my work got stale and terrible. And the beauty of comics is like, you can do, you can tell any kind of story anyway, as long as it was good, you will find an audience. Right. Um, and so when I got into the comic stuff, I, I made a promise that I was never going to tell a straightforward story that I was going to, I was going to go all in on, uh, on, on deconstruction, on experimental elements, on, um, on telling a story out of order, on reliable narrators. I was going to just play with what a story could be. The second issue of Banjax is told, uh, uh, Banjax is my kind of superhero noir, and it is a deconstruction of the superhero genre very uh, 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 you know, very short and sweet. Um, the second issue of Banjax is told from the point of view of a character who hasn't slept in seven days and it is literally driving him mad. So he's starting to see things like action figures are coming alive and talking to him and the world is bending and you don't know what is real and what is a manifestation of his psychosis, right? Um, and in the end, you're given no answers. Like you're presented with the story and you're left to figure out what, what was real and what wasn't the, the story as a whole it's basically a batman and robin story like batman goes crazy goes a wall uh his robin is tasked with bringing him in but he's not remotely up to it and and he has to learn on the job and get up to it so the odd issues uh are told from the batman's point of view the the uh the even issues are told from the robin's point of view each man is telling the same story but he is telling his own very slanted prejudiced version of it um, again, in the end, you're not given any answers. So you're left to, as the reader to kind of determine, okay, well, what is the truth here? Every person who reads it has a different version of the truth. And, and that spirit of, uh, of deconstruction, of experimentation uh, is, is in all of my stuff. Um, you know, the irony was uh, I started to apply this to my movie stuff and it, it went over like gangbusters. Uh, I, just, I just sold a TV series, The Lionsgate, with, uh, with the V Diggs. It, you know, it was a heist thing. And I had written a half dozen heist things in my in my career, and none of them had been made um, because, you know, basically every room you walk into in Hollywood, they all have two heist movies in development. They're all the fucking same, and so they never get made. And when I got when this thing was brought to me, when I started to explore it, I was like, okay, well, I can write the heist thing that I've written for you know, fifteen years, um, and I'll get paid handsomely, but it'll never get made, or all of this shit that I'm doing in comic books, all of this shit that's making me feel alive, I could do that here and just say, fuck it. And, uh, and we'll see what happens. So I did it. I didn't tell anybody about it. I turned it in. It took them longer to read it than it should have. And I was getting scared. And when we have our, our first like powwow, a lot of people are on the call and I'm, and I'm worried. I'm like, okay, am I getting fired here? What's happening? And they're like, we read it. And it takes too long. <laughs> And we fucking love it. All all this crazy shit you're doing, go and do more of it. Um, and it, you know, it, and so the irony of uh, of this whole journey is that, well, you know, um, this is kind of. I mean, it, it saved me creatively because it made me feel alive again. It made me fall back in love with 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 the process, with writing, with creating. But now it's also, you know, it's also making me money. It's also <laughs> like like in a very commercial way, it's translating to success. So that so that's cool. But but back to your question, like, um, I mean, that spirit of experimentation. Um, I learned that from the Pablo Picassos, from the, uh, the, the, the Willem de Koonings, uh, of, of, of the world. Um, and so I think that those two more than anybody, I mean, another painter that I'm really obsessed with is, uh, is Lucian Freud, um, mm -hmm. you know, who is the great grandson of, of Sigmund Freud, um, but a, but a British, you know, realist painter. He wasn't capturing photo reality. Um, he had a very depressed view of the world he had a, a there was a certain psychology that he applied to the world there was a way that he saw the world and so his paintings um reflected that you know what i'm saying and it is a really interesting character study he is the protagonist of his body of work i mean he's painting other people but he is seeing them he is seeing the world in such an ugly twisted way and it it doesn't say as much about them as it does about him as a person. And, you know, it, there was this really amazing exhibit in Los Angeles that I went to at, at the MoCA that I went to probably, I don't know, 20 times. And um, it was a, a career retrospective. 
and uh, they had his like very first three, three paintings. I mean, where he's, he's painting a kid basically, you know, and he was still alive at the time. I think he's passed away, but the final painting in the uh, that was so recent that the paint was still drying when they hung it. Just seeing, uh, just watching that, watching a man's entire career play out and, and, and what he's exploring and how his, how his point of view as an artist kind of, uh, kind of develops and solidifies and, and, and how he goes against that. There was like a physical texture to all his paintings. He used to like grind up sand and lead and, and mix it into his paint. So it had a texture and he would like build up noses and features on people. So it had this three dimensional quality. I mean, you're dealing with like a two dimensional at its core, very simple, you know, medium, right? I mean, painting is painting. Uh, but when you see somebody do something so different, and so interesting and so challenging and bring such a point of view to it, um, that's interesting. You know, in the way that like, uh, I don't know, like Ken Loach, I really kind of explored reality with some of his films. And then Soderbergh uh, in some of his best films is really doing like Ken Loach impression. Cassavetes, I think, did uh, something similar with kind of, you know, relationships and reality, his, his version of it. I think that Lucian Freud would make a really interesting Cassavetes like, filmmaker. I was curious because as soon as I saw your history um, side of things, so from just reading about you there, I was just like, I have to ask this type of question. This, <laughs> this sounds like it'd be up his alley. It, it, it was a good question, and, and, and what I like about the, how this interview is going is that um, I mean, these, you know, these are thoughts I've had, but I, I, I'm not. I have not drawn the career conclusions. Like I had never attributed my experimentation in comic books to, you know, being 19 and, and being, you know, in the mocha uh, every week for, you know, a couple of years and, 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 and really kind of, you know, falling in love with the experimentation of Picasso and, and, uh, and, and de Kooning and others. Uh, and I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's very much there. I mean, those are the roots of it all. And that, that's really interesting to me. I'm learning about myself here. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what I can teach an ordained monk such as yourself, but I'm glad I'm asking questions that are drawing upon your, your creativity. So that's a good thing. There's so much more I want to dive into, but I have my last four questions I do want to ask. Before I do that, though, and, and we will talk about where we can find you on social media and all that other mm -hmm. stuff as well, too. Is there anything that I haven't touched upon that you'd like to share with those that are watching and listening to this interview? My Ringo award-winning uh, political action thriller, Aberrant. Uh, and my four-time Ringo-nominated uh, uh, superhero noir band jacks are available in fine comic shops everywhere, um, and via Amazon and Comixology and all that noise. Um, did a couple of uh, uh, Kickstarter books that people seem to uh, uh, really dig um, that will find kind of the traditional publishing uh, 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 love uh, uh, soon, but later. But you can get uh, my astral projection thriller, The Jump, um, and my Fargo S crime drama, The Peacekeepers, uh, they're available right now via Packer Kit. If you go to the jump uh, two, the jump um, all one word and the number two, uh, the jump two dot um, you can find all that stuff. And you can find autographed copies of Aberrant and Banjax and um, really uh, rare con variants. You know, we have all these uh, kind of crazy variants that were only available at San Diego Comic Con in uh, uh, 2019 for three days or something like that. Um, I've, uh, I've hoarded, uh, uh, small caches of those. And so, um, you, it's, it's kind of a one-stop Riley Grant shop. So check that all out. And of course, um, Suicide Jockeys, uh, is, uh, hitting comic shops via Source Point Press, uh, issue one drops on August 25th. So, um, go get that and, uh, you know, tell your, uh, put it on your poll list. It's, uh, it's going to be a hell of a ride. Actually, I did want to ask this question before I ask my last four is what does uh, Source Point Press bring to yourself as a creator? They're an interesting outfit. I was with another publisher for um, for a couple of books when I got nominated for my Ringos for Aberrant. Um, we were at the awards ceremony and I was sitting at a table, you know, with folks from my my publisher at the time. And, um, and we were having fun. But then there was this table next to us. <laughs> That was just, they were, they were, I mean, they were just, they were just bonkers and they were having the time of their lives. And, uh, and, and, it, 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 you know, it was, it, it was just, it was an awesome party. And I'm like, I want to be over there. Who are those guys? Um, and so after, uh, you know, after the ceremony, um, you know, and, and, and we went for Emirates, so that helped a little bit. I just went over and, you know, I just introduced myself and, and they were the guys from Source Point Press. Um, and they turned out to be great guys and, um, and, you know, looking really closely at all the work they had done. Um, they're just smart. I mean, it's a, 
it sounds like a, a weird comparison uh, because of, of, of what's happened recently, but they remind me of kind of like a Miramax in the 90s, you know, um, you know, all that Weinstein crap aside, but um, that they're, they're finding like really interesting, challenging voices and, and putting them in front of people. Um, and, and they're doing stuff that, you know, maybe some other publishers wouldn't do. And, and that was really intriguing to me. I mean, they're tastemakers in a way. And so, yeah, I mean, I was looking for, I wasn't just looking for a, a publisher to, um, to to put one book out. I was looking for kind of a, you know, a home base. We talked about it for a long time and it, it wasn't kind of a matter of if, but when. And Suicide Jockey seemed like the, the good first project. They have really interesting, uh, they have their feet in other kind of ponds, you know, um, uh, tabletop gaming and, and all sorts of interesting stuff. And I mean, as a, as a guy, um, you know, I, I mean, obviously, I have like film and TV cover. You know, I, I don't, I don't need somebody to come in and do that for me. Um, my business for the last like ten years has been setting up, you know, my IP in Hollywood. Um, so I have that covered, and so I was looking for people who kind of brought other tools to the, to the game, you know, and, and they were very much it. So, um, so yeah, I mean, if you're a if you're a creator out there, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm all in on source point. So, uh, so check them out. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'm laughing uh, because I think most people would say, oh, their dad or, or you know, some, some teacher or something. like. That. There were a lot of these, but um, uh, Jean-Luc Picard, if I need to aim one, if I need to name one. You know, TV was different back then. It, it, you know, I, I think that. I think that a lot of television back then was looking, they were aiming high in terms of uh, um, uh, values. And, you know, we were coming out of kind of the Reagan era, right? And so it was like, what uh, what can a person be? Um, and yeah, like being glued to, to Star Trek when I was a kid. Um, and it was such an optimistic view of the world um, and and what we should value as, as people, as a society. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I was living in a place where you know, people didn't look to the proverbial stars, you know, again, like they didn't, they didn't leave where they were born, you know, and, and, and he was, he was driven and determined and he wanted to see what was, what was beyond the next star. Right. Uh, and so that was like, I don't know, that was earth shattering and intoxicating to me. And, uh, and I adopted a lot of that philosophy and he was my, um, he was my first Zen teacher in a lot of ways. Plus, he had a great head of hair. Wait, no, sorry, wrong person. That was correct. I, uh, I, I, I shaved my head for um, for seventeen years. I have this this you know lustrous uh, uh, full head of hair right now um, because my wife has demanded it. Um, but yeah, for about seventeen years, I, I I shaved my head, and part of it was because it was easy. And uh, but but I, you know, I, I can't divorce myself from the fact that it was probably because like I was a I was a Picard fanboy my entire life. From a professional standpoint, you've been in the film industry for a good while. You've written some amazing comic books. You're a Ringo Award-winning creator as well. Professionally, you're successful. But do you consider yourself personally successful? I'm getting there. Um, if you would have asked me, I don't know, certainly 10 years ago, but five or six years ago, I would say uh, no. Um, I, mean, I think we're all works in progress. I think that I've I've spent a lot of time doing the work. You know, I think we have to work hard to be the men and women, to be the people that we want to be and that we should be. I've been putting in the work for a good while now, so I'm getting there. Still room for improvement. A lot changed when I have a, a daughter who's about to turn five, so about five years ago. You know, my daughter came into the world, and um, I mean, it's a mirror, you know. You look down at, at, at this child <laughs> that you created. The world should make sense to us before then, but um, but it really rattles you and it really um, it, it really shows you, it really kicks you in the ass. Uh, it really lets you know that you need to get your shit together, that you're going to leave behind a world for this person. Um, and I talk about that programming. Almost all of her programming now is coming from me and coming from my wife. And so that's a, that's a high part of clear, right? And so um, I think you necessarily, uh, you know, um, become better. Um, so I'm on my way. More to come. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I didn't deal with them uh, very well for a long while. But again, uh, you know, we talk about working on things and, and being a work in progress. Uh, a work in progress it doesn't it doesn't help to ignore them. Here's the thing: like a lesson from Zen. I mean, I think that failure 
anguish, anything negative, right, is, is, is like a fire. And I think that, again, our programming dictates usually when we get hit with something like that, the first thing we do is take a big can of gasoline and, 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 and pour all over that fire and let it burn out of control and consume us. And what Zen teaches you is, again, just to sit and watch that fire. And, and to be with it and to let it be what it's going to be, not to, not to push against it or fight it or, or encourage it in any way. You just watch it and eventually it kind of burns out. I'm mostly there now. Here's another metaphor. If I can turn the fire metaphor into a meta five with, with my apologies, any of this stuff is a fire, right? Um, and again, a fire can burn out of control and consume you completely or if that fire can be harnessed, right? And and you can use it to send you to the fucking moon, right? Um, so I think that any of this stuff, I think failure can be and should be a, a, a motivating force. Um, you know, you you can you can harness that anger and use it. Um, I think any meaningful change that has been made in in an individual's life or like societally. Um, you know, the civil rights movement, uh, 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 now Black Lives Matter, all of this thing, it all happened because people were pissed off, right? Um, and if you're pissed off, it can make you do some terrible things. Uh, it can make you completely destroy yourself, destroy others, destroy a movement. Or again, it can be harnessed, right? And uh, it you know, can take you places. It can take society places. And so um, failure used to level me. You know, I would, I would, I would just be out of the game for a good while. Um, and what I've learned to do over time, mostly, um, and far from perfect, uh, is to kind of use failure to to piss me off, to motivate me, to uh, to move me on to the next thing. In the film business, the comics business, you have to have like ten balls in the air at all times, because every day one of them is going to fall, and hopefully on that day you get one or two balls back in the air, and it's just juggling, right? So. How do I deal with failure? I just keep chugging. And- the younger generation is looking at your work, whether it's in film or it, as in comics, and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation that you're currently raising as well is going to be inspired by your own creativity. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? That's a good question. I'm a lead by example type, I think, you know, um, or at least I've, I've learned to be. Um, <laughs> Let me see. If people followed my example, uh, you know, years ago, uh, uh, they probably would have been in trouble. Um, but I've learned that everybody's watching. And so I guess that would be my advice to, um, to the next generation is that everybody's watching. And so, uh, so lead by example. Um, be what you want them to be, you know, be the change you want to see, right? They're going to watch you work. They're going to watch you react to failure. They're going to, you know, they're going to take cues from you. Um, they're going to take cues from your art. You know, in terms of what it can be and what it should be and the messages that you're conveying. So put good stuff out there and put thoughtful stuff out there and put challenging stuff out there. And they will read that and they will absorb that and they will take the right lessons from that, hopefully. And then they'll do the same. Yeah, you're kind of like a, you're throwing a stone in the water, right? It's going to create ripples everywhere. Be careful what those, those ripples are saying, I guess. Well, I do hate to say this, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You know, before I let you go, where can we find you on social media and where can we support you uh, on this wild world of the internet? I am at Ryland Grant on all forms of social media. That's uh, uh, R-Y-L-E-N-D-G-R-A-N-C. Um, I always spell it because it's not a real name. Uh, my parents just kind of drunkenly arranged letters and saddled me with it. And so now I have to spell it for you. So at Ryland Grant on all forms of social media, uh, that's the best thing. Yeah, check out Banjax Mavarins on, uh, on Comixology or, or you know, your local comic shop um, and hit up um, to jump to .com and check out some of the other stuff I have uh, going on. And, and you said that um, Suicide Jock is coming out August 25th? Yeah, it, it's a <laughs> good of you to remind me that I have a book coming out. Uh, uh, yeah, August 25th, issue one hits uh, comic shops. It's a hell of a ride. Um, but also a, a meaningful and introspective one. So uh, something for everybody. Um, go check it out. I think you're going to love it. Um, and again, put it on your pull list. This first run is four issues, kind of following the uh, the Canto model. Uh, my friend David uh, Boer, um, you know, put out these kind of four issue stories, put out a trade at a time. And um, so yeah, uh, the the first arc 
little 4 issue story that you're going to love and uh, more to come. Well, like I said, thank you so much for coming on the show, Raylan. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I want to have you back on. I, I definitely want to have you back on because I think we just scratched the surface of, of yourself and your creativity. It's a good conversation. And, uh, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I try to try to dive a little deeper than the superficial questions that sometimes creatives get asked. So I'm glad that you, you took the time to answer them. So thank you so much. For yeah. that. Thanks so much. And thanks for listening guys. <laughs> that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can find this interview and thousands of others on our website, tgtmedia.com, and our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell, and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.